Come on, Coastal, how you guys doing this morning? Hey, um, my name is Shayla. I'm actually Pastor TJ's wife, and we, yeah, thank you, thank you. You know, we're in this series called Voices, and this series is all about, like, voices in our community or voices that maybe don't have a voice yet that need to be heard. And it's just hearing from some different communicators throughout this series. And I hope that you guys continue to come back week after week because we have some pretty incredible things planned along the way, some pretty amazing speakers. So hopefully you guys will continue with us through this series because it's going to be incredible. I mean, the speaker last week. Speaker last week was dynamite. Dynamite. (laughs) But, but next week, man, we, we've got a pastor from one of the largest and fastest growing churches in America. He is probably one of the top 10 communicators in the country going to be here next weekend. So I don't care what you're doing. Cancel those plans. Be here next weekend. We'll knock your socks off. Yeah. Just telling you. Just telling you. Yeah, that doesn't sound like anybody's changing their plans. <laughs> They're really excited. <laughs> so this week, I just wanted to take a minute and kind of set up what we're going to talk about today. Today we have a really special guest, Tom Lukasik from 4Kids. If you guys yeah. haven't heard of that organization, it's an amazing organization in our community. And TJ and I have kind of been on our own journey. And I just wanted to share a little bit with you about kind of what's been happening in our life and where things are going. You guys know that TJ and I have been married for 18 years And you know what? Honestly, you guys, it's been the greatest 18 years of my life. Every every service I've kind of picked on him, but really it's he's the easiest, most amazing husband that there is. And so I'm I'm so thankful for the 18 years that I've had and another 18 coming up. But over those 18 years, TJ and I have never been able to have children. And that's always been something that we've continued to ask God, God, why isn't this happening for us? It's been something that has just so weighed so heavily in our life. And so we've just continued to say, God, why, why, why? That's right. You might want to walk around with him for yeah, a minute. He, he's, 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 getting he's getting a little, a little fussy. Come on, dude. We're going to come so back we've, here and So we've never around. had biological children. And we've continued to say, why, why, why? How many of you guys have those things in your life where God hasn't answered something yet and you're going, God, why? I don't understand. It doesn't even make sense. And over the past couple of years, God has continued to move in my life and said, Shayla, I want you to move from the question why to the question what? Because it's not why is this happening in my life? It is what do I need to do right now while this is happening? And so we started to move to this question of, God, what do you want us to do in this season? What do you want us to do in this time of waiting where our hopes and our dreams maybe aren't happening right now? What do you want us to do? And we've had friends in our life over the past 15 years that have had foster kids, that have led foster care organizations, and we've always been like, you know what, rah, 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 we're going to champion your cause. You guys are amazing. We're going to stand behind you. We're going to support you. We're going to cheer you on. Good for you, but not for us. And TJ and I continued to say, man, foster care would just be too hard. It would just be too hard on us. It's hard enough when somebody leaves your church, let alone like you invite someone into your home that's living with you, and you have to let them go. No, it's just too hard for us. And we continued to say that over and over again as people would come to us and say, why don't you guys do foster care? No, no, no. We're excited for you, but that's not for us. And a couple years, actually last year, we were doing a sermon series on the book of James. And TJ asked me to speak out of James 2. And I vividly remember sitting down and opening up the Bible to James 2. and, And I started reading to prepare for my message, but God had something prepared for me that day. And as I sat down to read that, I I was reading the verses out of James 2, and it's James 2, 15 and 16, and it says this, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, basically, bless your heart, I'll pray for you, but I'm not gonna do anything. But you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And basically, God like throat punched me in that moment. And he said, Shayla, there's these kids out there with need. 
And I've given you everything that you need to meet the need. I've given you a home with extra bedrooms. I've given you room in your heart to love. What good is your faith if you just say, oh, that's your responsibility, it's not mine. And so God began to, to kind of open up my heart and say, Shayla, yes, you, you have a choice. You can keep saying it's, it's, it's too hard, it's too hard, it's too hard. But those kids don't have a choice. And so I was like, oh, man. Okay, God, like, God you've captured my heart. I will, I will say yes. Like, I will meet that need. But, Lord, you've got to talk to TJ. <laughs> And so I remember going to TJ and I said, hey, TJ, not, not right now, but later on this year, can we revisit the foster care conversation? And he's like, oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. So at the end of last year in December, at the end of December, we had gone on vacation and on our way back, we had the conversation. And I remember TJ saying to me, Shayla, I know that God has spoken to you about this. I know that God has spoken directly to your heart about this, and I want you to know that because God's voice is so loud in this space in your life, I trust that. Let's do it. And several months later, um, we went and picked up a five-day-old baby boy named Alexander, and he's been with us for the, for the past four months, and it's been, honestly, you guys, the, the greatest four months of of our life. It's been so incredible to have this child in our home. Now, there's, cha there's challenges along the way, too, but it's fulfilled a place in us, and, and you know what? He, he might not have a voice, but I will be his voice, and you know what? We need people that are like that, whether it's foster care or something else. We need to stand up and to take care of the needs that are around us in our community. And so that's what today is all about. And I want to turn it over to Tom and to Pastor TJ to share a little bit about four kids. How are you guys doing today? Well, I am pumped to be back with you guys. I just arrived from China uh, yesterday morning, really, really early. I'm kind of on the wrong time schedule right now. And uh, I was thinking about today, this morning at 1 a.m., because I was up, because I'm still living on China time at the moment, and uh, my son, who, who, who you just saw, normally doesn't, doesn't wake up in the middle of the night. He, he's been blessed with great parenting, and so he sleeps throughout the night, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> actually, we don't have a clue what we're doing, uh, but so, so he woke up in the middle of the night, and because I was up and brought out in bushy tail, I was like, ah, oh, I just go get him, and, and so I got him, and I I fed him, and then I was, I was rocking him back to sleep in his room, and uh, there was this moment where, and this is, this is probably my favorite moment of, of, of being a foster parent right now, is there's this moment where I'm rocking him, he's about to fall asleep, and he looks up at me with his eyes, and he has this crooked smile, and he just does this like little crooked smile, and then he starts cooing, and then he falls asleep. And I thought to myself, like, how innocent is this child right now? Like, there are a lot of other places he could be right at this moment where his innocence would be ripped from him. He happens to be lucky that all he's known is us. But for a lot of children, they know their parents, and all of a sudden, they have their entire world taken away and their innocence is lost in that moment. And we're in this series called Voices, and I thought about this, of the fact that he does not have a voice to communicate to you today what is happening in his world. And so today, we're going to be his voice so that you can know, so that you can be aware. So we're going to give the voice to those kids who have no voice today. And so I have my friend Tom Lukasik here with me. He is the vice president at 4Kids. Um, I've known Tom for, for quite a few years. He's been harassing me to, uh, to talk about foster care, poking me over and over again, encouraging me. I, I, I kept telling him the story over and over again, like, I, I, won't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk about this because then I'm, I'm kind of responsible for it. And um, he, he's worked at 4Kids for 18 years. And so 
I'm pumped to have him share a little bit about foster care today, the need, and, and what is happening right here in Broward County. So this is kind of be a conversation here between some friends, and we're just inviting you in on the conversation. And so, Tom, why don't you uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how, how you kind of came into this whole foster care thing, just for yourself personally. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, church, for allowing us to be here today to talk about what the church the church needs to do for these children. It's not about four kids. It's about us. It's about what God is calling us to do. So God called my wife and I to do something. It was around 25 years ago that we had a, a similar message in our church as you're hearing today. It was actually James 1.22 where our pastor was teaching, preaching on being a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And Linda and I just kind of looked at each other going, oh my gosh, we are hearers only. And we thought we were living a good Christian life because we were showing up for church every Sunday, we were writing a check, we were working hard, we were successful, and we were able to bless the church like God needed our money or else, you know, <laughs> what's going to happen? <laughs> so we realized we were fooling ourselves and just started studying God's Word a little more and a little more. And of course, five verses later in James 1, 27 is a powerful verse on what we should be doing regarding the orphan, and we'll get to that in a minute. But and then in the next chapter, Shayla just told you what happens if we know and we don't do anything. We just say, oh, God bless you. We're praying for you. So that broke our heart. That touched our heart. That started us on a new trajectory. And uh, 24 years ago, my wife and I moved into a group home with six little girls. And so we went, we jumped a little bit deeper into the water than I'll you say, are. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom's crazy. Everybody say, Tom's crazy. Tom is crazy. Come on, that wasn't very good. Come on, say Tom's crazy. Tom's crazy. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Tom. I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we did that. And uh, in the same way as these guys, I don't have any biological children. I married my wife. She was a single mom, and I adopted my stepson. So I have one son and 57 different foster children over the last 24 years. That is a terrible clap. Did you just hear him? <laughs> 57. 57. Some of y'all are like, I'm struggling with one kid. 57 kids. But it was over 24 year, years, so it you know, wasn't all at it's once. It's like shuffling two new ones every year. Come on, somebody. It's like, yeah. that's impressive. Well, it's, it's, it has been the most incredible. I, I never, ever, ever thought 26 years ago this is what God had in store for me. Not at all. I was on a totally different track, my track. I like his track better. Why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit about Four Kids, how, how Four Kids came about and, and how you got involved? And Yeah, so those, uh, while Linda and I were in the secular world doing foster care, we were trying to do it the way God called us to do it, and we saw this need, and other people in the community saw this need, especially one church locally realized there's a huge need, and they did a service similar to this to tell the community to tell their congregation, we need foster parents. There's kids out there that need us. And that point 21 years ago, it started a movement of Christian foster care in this community that is actually renowned around the country and around the world because we're doing something a lot of cities aren't doing. And then a couple years later, uh, four kids got started as a Christian foster care agency. So we are contracted with the state and working through the church. It's a really, yeah, there's another cool experience that most people don't realize can even happen, that the church and the state can partner. They can yeah. work together. Yeah. We just follow our rules, they follow their rules, and we get along well because we're doing more than just about anybody else. So right now, after 21 plus years, we have ministered to more than 25,000 children through four kids. Yeah, that's amazing. And we've had close to 600 adoptions come through during that time. And the goal of foster care is reunification, but occasionally it will happen where parental rights are terminated and that child is available for adoption, so our families have done that. And our families have done something that is truly remarkable in this country, in this world, in history. There has never been a failed adoption through the Four Kids Ministry. Now, wow. there's been some, thank you, <laughs> there's been some tough cases. I've been in the middle of some of those tough cases, but by the church wrapping around those families and being there for them, they're able to say, we're not going to give up on you. 
just as we wouldn't give up on our own child and God has not given up on us. Amen? What, what's amazing, and, and Tom didn't say, is the, the church that said, hey, we're going we're gonna to make a difference for these kids was, was Calvary Chapel of Fort Lauderdale. And, uh, you know, they said, hey, we see a need in our community, and uh, we're going to do something about it. And I'm so thankful for Calvary Chapel Fort Lauderdale for seeing a need and saying, you know what, we're not just going to sit on the sidelines and watch the need pass us by, but we're going to get in the game and we're going to make a difference. Man, I celebrate that church. I'm so thankful for their influence over almost 30 years here in our community, making a difference for the least of these, the, the, the destitute, the broken, saying, hey, we're, we're going to make a huge difference. So, so Tom, why don't, why don't you... Uh, Tell us a little bit about what's happening currently in Broward County when it comes to foster care. Like, what are the current statistics? How, how many kids are in foster care here in Broward County? What's the need? What's happening? Well, the need is huge. Right now, there are about 1,600 children in the foster care system just in our county. And those kids need to be in a loving, godly home, a Christian home. But they're not. They're not all. There's a lot of them in shelters, a lot of them in group homes, a lot of them. We don't have enough homes in this county. We're sending children to different parts of the state of Florida because we don't have enough homes. Last month, 103 children came into care due to abuse, neglect, or abandonment. In one month, in our incredibly affluent community, 103 children came into care because something was going wrong in their home. And a large portion of those were due to drug abuse, and part of that is the opioid crisis that we're all experiencing. So if you, want to, if you watch the news and you see there's this crisis, what can I do? Be a foster parent. Be there for that child in that time of distress. One of the things that the general public assumes, and I read this a while back, that 86% of the general public assumes kids come into foster care because of something the child has done wrong, and it's just the opposite. It's something that was done wrong to that child. They are innocent victims of abuse, neglect, abandonment, and they need us. They've experienced trauma that you can't even imagine, but that trauma can be healed, and that's what 4Kids is all about, hope, homes, and healing. That's our paradigm of what we're trying to do. So we need people to say, yes, I can be part of this. I can help solve this crisis. Now, you shared a stat in an earlier, earlier service. Uh, out of those 103, how many were under the age of five? Because um, this is crazy to me. 58 children out of that 103 were five years old or younger. Talk about innocent victims. Yeah. That right there, my friends, is crazy to me. Like, they're not even getting a chance. How many five-year-olds are not causing problems of that magnitude to be removed from their homes? Their homes are causing problems that are causing them to be removed. And, and, and that is a, is a huge, huge problem tragedy and epidemic that is this happening in our community. In fact, I, I, I told Tom and, and Kevin, who's, who's the president, I said, one of the things that, that I hate about four kids, and this, I said this in a joking way, is that as a foster parent, they send out emails every day of kids that are being removed saying, hey, here are some kids that were removed. And almost every day, it's a one-year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old. And I think to myself, man, where are all these kids going? Who is, who is advocating for this one-year-old, this two-year-old, this three-year-old who has no voice for himself? And so, Tom, what, what can the church do? What is the responsibility of the church? Or is this the responsibility of the state? Should we just go, hey, state of Florida, you, you take care of this because they're so good at solving problems, aren't they? Well, as I read God's Word, I don't see anywhere in there that says this issue is the responsibility of government. I see over and over this issue is the responsibility of the church. And we have kind of abdicated our responsibility for years, and we've got a slide here that will show what happens when the state takes care of kids in foster care. The outcomes are horrendous. When you think of these children becoming homeless or going to jail or doing drugs or, or all the different negative effects of what happens when, when we don't step in, and I'm not showing this slide to point the finger at the state for how they've messed up. I'm showing the slide to kind of point the finger back at us, the church, because it's not their responsibility, it's ours. So we can be that, that difference maker in these lives, and, and that's what we have to do. And we've, we'll talk about this over and over. We know what James 1.27 says. It says, 
pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God the Father is visiting orphans in their time of distress and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. It's practical charity, it's personal purity. It doesn't say everybody should take a child, an orphan child, into their home. But it does say everybody should do something. That's pure and undefiled religion. So everybody here can do something. We need foster parents. Absolutely, we need foster parents. And we have a lot of foster parents in this church. Actually, percentage-wise, this is one of the biggest percentages of foster parents in the church in South Florida. So kudos to Coastal Community for all that you are doing. Yeah. Thank you. But there's still a lot to be done, so that's why we need more. But we also need people that will say, I can't foster, but I can do something. I can wrap around a foster parent. I can babysit. I can do respite. I can bring meals. I can cut the lawn. I can come over and do laundry. I can be a handyman for a foster family. Those are what we're trying to do, and we're starting a new ministry calling, calling it the Family Advocacy Ministry. And we need people to join that team and wrap around those families. Wrap around like you have for Shayla and TJ and, and be there for them when they need help. And uh, Andrew Holmes right over here is going to be heading up that part of the ministry. Mm -hmm. They've got a table in the back. Andrew and um, Marissa will be there. Marissa is also part of our foster care team and our, uh, our team to help out on this, this type of work and our volunteer team. So we are looking for people who will say yes to fostering or yes, I can do something. And that's pretty much, I think, everybody in this room. Amen? Yeah. I, I asked you in a previous service, how many kids um, were removed in Broward County last year? Just, just a rough yeah. number. Right around 1,000 children last year. In one year, 1,000 children brought into the system. So what that means, and, and, and we're just going to generalize this, is about 90 kids every month are removed from their homes and put into a state of shock where everything is changed in a moment. And, uh, you know, Tom said something. He said, we, ha we have a responsibility as the church. Because if it's not us that's going to take responsibility, then who's going to do it? Who's going to advocate on their behalf? And, and here's what I know is, as I understand, not all of us can be foster parents. And I'm not expecting all, the, all of you guys to rush out to the four kids table afterwards and sign up to be foster parents, nor do I actually want you all to do that. It's because it just wouldn't be good, okay? <laughs> we'll just leave it like that. But, but we can all be doing something to make a difference for those that are hurting and broken and in need in our community. And uh, as I was traveling back, I was thinking about today. And I was thinking about this Sunday. And there's a, there's a, a passage of Scripture in John chapter 13, where Jesus, Jesus is, is getting ready to go to the Passover feast, and it says it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. So Jesus is in this moment where he's about to show everybody what the full extent of his love looks like. What is, what is the full extent of Jesus's love for the world? And if you were to continue reading in that passage, what actually happens is, is they're getting ready to go to the Passover feast. And as the disciples and Jesus are arriving for this meal, they all walk in the door and there is a basin and there is a bowl. And the reason there is a basin and a bowl is because when you would travel feet would get dirty, feet would get nasty, they'd be grimy. And it, that meant that it was somebody's responsibility to go, you know what, I'm going to take care of our feet. I'm going to take care of cleaning up the mess that is around me, the grime that's around me, the dirtiness that's around me. And one by one, the disciples walk in and see the bowl and they go, you know what, that's somebody else's job. That's somebody else's responsibility. Listen, I know that people are dirty. I know that we're messed up. I know I can see the need. I can see the hurt. I can see the brokenness. But you know what? Somebody else should take care of that. That's somebody else's job. That's not my job. And one by one, they walk past thinking somebody else is going to go do that. And all of them pass by and the need is still there. And Jesus walks in the room and realizes that nobody was willing to get in the mess 
Nobody was willing to get into the dirtiness. And he goes, and it, the Bible says he takes off his clothing. In other words, he strips himself of, him, of himself. You know, one of the hardest things for me, Tom, in this whole process was exactly what Shayla said. I couldn't imagine the, see, I go through pain as a pastor. Every time one of you guys leave that I have a relationship with and you go, you know what? This just isn't the church for me anymore and go somewhere else. It breaks my heart. Like, I know that people go, I, this isn't personal. Listen, it's all personal to me. I'm just being honest. It's personal to me. You want to know why? Because I'm investing my life in you. And I thought to myself, man, how could I ever bring a child in and possibly that child leave? I actually asked Tom about this, and Tom, you, you, you said something really, really beautiful about God and that child. Can you, can, you, can you say that statement again that you told me? I'm putting you on the spot right yeah, here. I, I think it is that, and it, we talked about it in a lot of times, that yes, our heart is going to break. We sang about that. When, when heartache comes into your home, what do we do? And we trust God. He loves these children much more than we could ever imagine. And he has a plan. God's word tells us that. He's got a plan for each one of us. We want it to include us when we fall in love, when we invest, when we give our hearts to this child. But we can't, we can't guide that process. We've got to let God guide the process for us. Not only that, but he's like, you're protecting your heart. But who's protecting that child's heart? So Jesus washes their feet. And then in verse 12, it says, when he returns to the table, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to the place. He says, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. He goes, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And that's a great word. He goes, man, I've, I've, I've set the pace. I, I've, I've set the bar. I've basically said, hey, listen, what I'm willing to do, you should go and mimic. And then I love, I'm gonna skip down to verse 17 because I love what he says in verse 17. He says, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. See, the reason I wanted to bring Tom here today is because now that you know the crisis that's happening in our community, now that you know the reality that every month 90 to 100 kids are being removed from their homes and 50% of them are under the age of five and there's an innocence that's there, there's a responsibility that comes with information. Jesus says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Meaning we have a choice. There's a choice that every single one of us have to make every single day. Because here's what I know, is that every day, whether it's foster care or anything else, there are moments where you see brokenness, where you see hurt, where you see emptiness, where you see a need. And what happened in Jesus' life is every time he would see that, there would be, it says in the Bible, he was moved with compassion. And when Jesus was moved with compassion, what did he do? He moved towards that brokenness. And every day I believe that there is, our hearts start to go out to something. We see a need and, and all of a sudden something starts to well up within us. There is this move of compassion. And a lot of us go, well, somebody should do something about that. Or they say, man, that's the church's job or that's four kids' job or that's somebody else's job. But what Jesus is telling us is he's saying, listen, that's not somebody else's job. That's your job. The reason I moved you with compassion is because I want you to do something about it. 
Like that move of compassion should compel us to action in life. To be the living hands and feet of Jesus in that situation. See, Jesus is going, listen, there's a big difference between knowing something and doing something. It's time for some of us to do something about the things that are compelling us and moving us in life. God has never called us to go to church. He's called us to be the church. See, a lot of us equate our faith with Sunday morning. But being the church happens seven days a week. 24-7. This is a crisis that we're talking about, foster care, that can be solved. There are more churches in Broward County than there are foster children. Now listen, church, I'm going to piss some people off right now. But don't, don't go on Facebook today and go, I'm pro-choice or pro-life, not pro-choice. I'm pro-life. I'm pro-life, man. We need, don't abort babies if you're not willing to do anything about the freaking babies that are right here. Hundred and four thousand children waiting to be adopted in the United States. 157 million people claiming to be pro-life. Disparity. Let's do this. I asked Tom and Kevin, what church has the most amount of foster kids? They said Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. I said, like, how many, how many, how many kids are they to get care of? They're like 75 to 100. I was like, we can beat that. <laughs> we can't. If your heart is moving you today, that's not emotion, that's the Holy Spirit. Don't walk away and do nothing because then you'll just be a hearer of His Word, not a doer of it. Let's be doers of His Word. Let's make a difference. And let's change these kids for eternity. Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. Going is moving with compassion towards those in need. And I can't think of a better place to disciple a child than right there in your home. Where they're going to see Jesus lived out 24-7. In a place with unconditional love. A place that values and builds them up. A place that I believe God can use us to restore their innocence that was taken from them because our God is a God of restoration. And I believe that he can use you to do that in their lives. Would you guys bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, I thank you for each and every person that's here at Coastal today. And I know that 
This is not always one of those days where people are like, they're glad that they came to church. Because now we know some things. We're not ignorant to the facts. We're not ignorant to the realities of what's happening all around us. And God, you said, now do you know these things? You'll be blessed if you do them. God, my prayer today, whether it's foster care, whether it's the the homeless guy on the corner, whether it's your neighbor that's in need, whatever it is that is in your life that when the Holy Spirit starts to move us with compassion, God, we would not look at those situations and think that's somebody else's job, that's somebody else's responsibility. But God, we'd go, no, no, no. God, you're calling me. You're calling me in this moment, in this place, in this time to make a difference. God, and I pray that we wouldn't just be a hearer of what you're doing, but we would respond with love and grace and compassion. And God, that you would move us to action in life. And while we may not be able to solve the entire problem that's out there in this world, we can solve one person's problem. We can't make a difference in one life. I love what Mother Teresa said. She said, somebody asked her, how do you change the world? She goes, one person at a time. God, I pray that we would be moved with compassion. One person at a time. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray.